Welcome. We're going to get started. Welcome to this Sunday's reading where every week we bring writers from the IWP with students from one of the UI's several MFA programs. Our first reader today will be Haria Kolima, an Albanian-born writer raised in the Midwest. She is the recipient of a Fulbright Research and Writing Grant to Albania, where she created the country's first youth writing program and online writing lab. She holds an MA in the Humanities from the University of Chicago and is an MFA candidate in fiction at the Iowa Writers' Workshop where she is at work on a novel and several short stories. Please join me in welcoming her. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's so wonderful to share this space um, with the IWP and to read alongside Kevin and Sue Mist. Um, and yeah, so thank you, friends, family, and everybody else who are new faces to me um, for listening today. So, I'll be reading from a short story. It's quite a long short story, so I'm only reading about half of it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll, that'll work well. <laughs> All right, so it's called Dead Butterflies Smell Like Honey. Can you guys hear me okay, by the way, this way? Okay, perfect. Dead Butterflies Smell Like Honey. It was the kind of Saturday that held the sadness of a Sunday. Viola and Arba muttered their discontent under their breaths as they searched for their father's box of bones in the ossuary, which itself was a box of sorts, less in the sense that it had only four walls, and more in the sense that it felt ensnaring and gray and smelled of memories forgotten. Memories were now all they had in middle age. Always one for superstitions, Fiola pulled her ear to ward away possible curses that lingered in the three years since burying their father without any mom's blessing an irreparable mistake. Following her sister through the rows of silver and numbered boxes, she worried she'd hear him rattling somewhere on the shelves, his bones dancing furiously in their temporary grave. She pulled her ear again when she imagined being ushered to the other side in the same way, as a corpse and not a soul, gone without any mom. Fill the stuff for law, whispered Fiola. It's not God's forgiveness we need, it's Bobby's. Hush your mouth, Arba said. Don't believe in that silliness. Oh, God rest his soul, my poor dear Bobby. Hush, I said. She imagined herself in a coffin, maggots smolting in her waxen eyes and wavy brown hair, or whatever would be left of it in old age. We should have let him stay in Elbasan, she thought. It was Athens that killed him. Athens, Athens, Athens. We should have let him stay in. While Fiola sought protection from divine justice, Arba welcomed whatever would come her way, for no god existed in her world and no retribution could be had. Her red and tangled hair was almost a bold enough symbol to match her abrasive disposition. In her hand, the thin, hole-punched paper did not quiver, for Arba was stern and still during such difficult times. She ignored the document's Greek legalese, its blue stamp and signature from the regional director at the bottom. Instead, she reread the numbers assigned to her father's box, 9058. She had grown used to the absence of her father, used to the silence of the phone, used to the idea he was elsewhere, still perusing the fruit stands for whatever was in season. White mulberries, green plums, cornelian cherries. Though she missed him, his burial was a legal matter, his body a scientific one. The existence of a soul, to her, could never be true. Her skin prickled, nonetheless, waiting to find him dead once more. Every box in the ossuary was a second death, a room of a thousand second deaths. She scanned the numbers stacked on each shelf, still looking for the one that mattered most. 9058, 9058, 9058. We'll never find him, Fiola said. We're looking, Yola. Use your eyes. Eyes? What eyes? If I had eyes, then I would have foreseen Bobby withering as quickly as he did here, and you would have seen why he didn't want to be here. The loneliness killed him, Arba. We killed him. Yola, it's true not to speak like this, around Bobby and around them, Arba said, motioning to all the hundreds of boxes, playing on her sister's belief in spirit. Fiola wanted to say more. She wanted to enumerate all the other reasons she blamed herself and Arba for their father's death, 
like the idea of being buried away from their mother in an orthodox cemetery. The air weighed heavily between them, as if to forbid breathing. Fiola shut herself up for fear that perhaps she had been disturbing the souls attached to the other bones in boxes. She hated how Arba made her feel, like a child, like a stranger to herself, in other words, like her sister. It made her want to throw a box, to knock over a shelf. She pictured shelves falling one onto the other, spilling bones and dust into mounds like one mass grave. That moment of anger somehow brought her sights to what needed finding right there before her. 9058. Her chest sank with pangs of dreadful dread. It, he, is here. Well, go on, grab the box. It's not a box, said Fiola. It's Bobby. And I cannot hold Bobby again when I've already said goodbye. How could I? He would have wanted us to take care of him, and he would have wanted us to hold him, said Arba, nudging her sister aside, pulling out the object and holding it in her arms. She had the stiffness of a fishwife carrying dead Korani trout. She felt as if she caught something, like the fisherman in her father's favorite story, the one about the man who catches a fish and releases it back into the sea, only to have it return again and grant him one wish. She loved the tale, not because she believed in its truth, but because her father told it. It reminded her that the extraordinary was impossible, the stuff of stories. The two sisters shambled through the dim maze of shelves and boxes, past the few other people dressed in black and searching the ossuary, and found the door from which they came. Outside was the inescapable August heat, worse this year than any year prior. It clammed their skin and squeezed their throats. It felt as if the sun were the only thing left in the world. Its brightness stung both sisters' eyes, phosphines collaging their sights in pinks and yellows and blues. They began their trek back to the cemetery entrance, and cats ran from one tree's shade to the next, skittering like their paws were on fire. I didn't realize Bobby would be so light, Arba said, beads of sweat salting her eyes. We should, make, we should open it and make sure it's him, said Fiola. How would we be able to tell if it's him? Bones always reveal who they belong to, said Fiola. Just pay attention to their scent, their shape, their color, the way they rattle. They hide nothing. No need to get so poetic, Arba said, as Fiola lifted the lid. Inside were messes of blue, red, orange, yellow, green, and gray, purple and pink, periwinkle and mauve, scarlet and more scarlet. Then came the forms behind each hue. They were not bones, they were butterflies dead and dry butterflies. Arba turned the box around and compared the numbers on the paper with the numbers on the box. Fiola stood silently, staring at the lid in her hands. A smell like dried flowers pierced her noses, a smell like honey. But the numbers match, Arba whispered. Fiola sifted her hands through the butterflies, but her fingers could not locate the wrinkled surface of bone. Nothing was him, only fuzzy feelers and papery wings, which were not always whole. Some butterflies were missing these wings. Others were missing legs or eyes, little monsters in a pile. This must be a mistake, Arba said, and then repeated herself more angrily. This is a mistake. She took the lid from her sister's hand and sealed the box. The honey scent lingered, nonetheless. We must go back to the directorate. We'll show them a good prank. What do they think we are, stupid, idiots? They saw his Albanian name and decided they'd rather throw the bones to the dogs than give them their peace. Don't say that, Arba, it's not true. How is it not true? That's what they think of us, of all of us. They think. I'm not talking about what the Greeks think of us, said Fiola. I hope they hate us for all I care. I'm telling you to stop talking about Bobby like he's just boxes and bones. Fiola, that is the reality right now. He is or should have been bones. This is or should have been his box. I don't love him any less than you and I'm tired of the way you insist on yourself as his protector and me as his enemy. Well, you're the one who brought him here, Fiola said, and you helped. Two men with shovels approached the entryway from the western part of the cemetery at about the same time as Arba and Fiola arrived at the tall gates. The men's faces did not crinkle in the sunlight. Fiola wondered if perhaps they were so used to being outdoors that the brightness no longer forced them to squint. Signal me, Arba called out to them in Greek. Are you the ones in charge of digging up bones? Nay, one of the men yelled in confirmation. They stopped at the entrance. Arba sped up to confront them, and Fiola followed suit. Arba lifted the lid of the metal box. 
Reach in here. Go ahead. Tell me what you find. Both men looked at each other with uncertain and furrowed brows. The taller of the two carefully extended his hand and seized a clump of butterflies. I can explain each part to you, he said, if that's what you are looking for. This, for example, is the femur. Blood rushed to Arba's temples and dizzied her. She wished to hit the butterflies out of his hand. The femur, ha, who was your anatomy teacher? Signal me, but I don't understand. He dropped the little monsters back in with the others. We just do the dirty work and take out the graves. We do the best we can. Other people clean and organize the boxes and teeth and everything else. While Arba began to shake, Fiola took note of the man's face, stolid and serious. She put a hand on Arba's shoulder and whispered to her in Albanian. I don't think he sees them as butterflies. Signomi, Signomi, the man said. He unfurled his hands in apology, revealing calluses on the palm, flaky and yellow mounds of skin, hardened as if a new set of knuckles. Behind them, a cat chased after a dragonfly between each end of the entrance, finally swatting it down and lapping it up for lunch. With that, the men left. Fiola replaced the lid of the box. She thought back to the times she tried visiting graves in Elbasan. Her mother, her aunts, her uncles, some cousins, unable to find them. They do not want to be found, her father, gray and shrunken, used to say as they paced under the noontime sun. It was always a moral grievance. They're upset with us, he'd say. We've done something wrong. Let us take this as a moment of reflection and correction. She always thought it curious that he said us, not that they're upset with you or me. It seemed that, to him, reward or punishment depended on God's belief in the plurality of justice. Bobby is angry at us, Fiola said to Arba, both sisters drowning in their sweat. He doesn't want us to see him. Stop with your superstitions, Yola. We did everything we could. Three years later and your lack of emotion for him comes as no surprise. You finished grieving after three days, yelled Fiola. You know nothing of my grief, and you know nothing of mine. Fiola sniffled soft sniffles. It bewildered her how bereavement caused even the most mature people to retreat into infancy. They had always had their disagreements, she thought, and always would. It was a fact as true as her names. Their feet grated the gravel in unison as they headed toward their car. The cicadas buzzed, their sound thickening the hot, hot air. Arba hugged the box to her chest, hating the way her sister made a weapon of her sadness, made her feel like her love was inadequate. Arba was never one to say, I love you, or give a hug, or cheer another up. But her presence, her ability to make decisions in trying times when others could not, seemed sufficient. Didn't Fiola understand her pragmatism was real love? At the vehicle, a 2001 Opel Corsa, they left open the doors to release the heat, long enough for Fiola to notice an elderly man sitting on a bench under the shade of the cypresses and pines, not more than 40 steps away. Like her father, he wore a cream-colored sun hat and held a walking cane at his side. Like her father, he had folds in his faraway face. Like her father, his belly hung over his belt. But with her slowly failing eyesight, she had the feeling that many elderly men looked like one another for no fault except her own. Arba, doesn't that man remind you of... Fiola could not finish the sentence. Arba turned to look at him, and he waved. She yelled out in Greek, Yasas, are you okay in this heat, old man? He responded and said in Albanian, Po, po, the bus will be here soon. His voice was scruffy like their father's, and he spoke loudly like him, too. He made being a stranger no different than being family, and neither sister could parse her feelings, if the similitudes induced anxiety or comfort or a feeling without a name. Arba hushed up at his all-too-familiar sound, and Fiola spoke up instead. An Albanian, Prashandetia Jaji, when are you expecting the bus? Oh, probably in 20 minutes, maybe 30, who knows, maybe 40. I'm used to the wait. I like listening to the cicadas. His words struck Fiola. It was something her father used to do too. Listen. He would sit on park benches listening to rock pigeons and stock doves and mason bees and paper wasps. Anything with wings. He said it brought him closer to God. Fiola hoped that were true. We can give you a ride home, Fiola said. I couldn't, really. Don't you worry about an old man like me. I've survived everything in this life. What's a little weight? 
Arba could not gather her voice. His familiarity gave her an ominous feeling, like having hands wrapped around her throat. She rushed into the car's back seat and closed the door. Fluttering came from within the box on her lap, but when she lifted the lid, they were still dead and wrinkled. Fiola glared at her. You'll get heat stroke out here, Jaji. If you do not come, we will not go. She felt responsible for him. In doing him a service, perhaps she could save her father's soul. He was her salvation, their salvation. Well, if you insist, I will not ruin your fun, the old man said. He wobbled into standing with his cane. Fiola walked toward him, casting a backward glance at Arba, who looked straight ahead. Up close, the lines on his face became more obvious to Fiola. The hook of his nose more pronounced, the lobes of his ears curled upward in the way she remembered from childhood and all the years thereafter. There was the birthmark she recognized too, a plain circular mark at the ridge of his collarbone. Its ordinary shape was always what had made it special to her, something so uniquely her father's. She wanted badly to ask him to remove his sunglasses, to bask in what she hoped would be under them, hazel eyes with veins and specks of gray. Eyes that knew her as a woman who had meant to care for her father in his last days, not a woman who had uprooted him to die without his God. How was she to have known the church would disallow their final duel? How was she to have known that even after all these years, guilt and uncertainty would no longer be feelings, but rather necessary parts of her being? She held his arm tightly and stared in awe. Mafal Jaji, Fiola began. You will see a Kami? I am Javdet, the old man responded. His name differed from their father, Chemal. And you both? She told him both her name and Arba's, and he repeated them back. You are Albasani, Fiola asked. I can tell by the way you pronounce your A's. The man bobbed his head in confirmation. My home is at the end of Ruga Dieter by Ura Zaranikas, right around the corner from Bimi's Chokta shop. The old man slid his feet toward the car and moved even faster than Fiola, who <coughs> held on as if he were leading her to his vehicle and not hers. When they finally arrived, she buckled the old man into the passenger seat and then assumed her position behind the wheel. So where do you live, Jaji? She asked, starting the engine. You can drop me off at the Kikseri Square. I'll walk from there. No, no, what is your exact address? The old man let out a sigh and looked down at his great hands. I, I don't, I don't remember where I live. From the back seat, Arba felt sadness prick the edges of her heart. How it hurt to witness this old man in need and not know how to help him. It reminded her of the times her father disappeared, even in El Basan. He would stroll the streets, walking down Boulevardi to Turismi to Zaranika, but when he turned back, the city was transformed. I leave home looking down, he'd say, setting the cobblestones and bricks, because if I look up, I'm no longer in El Basan. Towers, so many towers. They disfigured our city with those atrocious money laundering structures. I miss El Basan of Paco y Mia, and Fort Javahit, and Sport y Dieter. This monster we call capitalism has devoured the only places I loved, the only places that keep me alive. Oh, God, help us all. These memories tricked Arba into feeling such moments could be recreated if she simply returned to his doorstep and knocked. Nostalgia, how dangerous and repulsive it was. Do you have any children we can call, Fiola asked, or relatives? Oh, the old man shoved an eager hand into his pocket and withdrew a flip phone. He opened it very steadily and studied the menu's buttons, his fingers shaking before he jammed each arrow. Beep, beep, boop. He handed it to Fiola wordlessly. She toggled between menus, but not a name sat under the contact list. It was only a white screen with a large heading in Italian reading Contatti. I don't see any names, Jaji. There's nothing in your call history either. Do you remember anyone's number? Oh, try. Three zero six nine three nine zero five eight, he said at first, then took the phone from Fiola's hand and input the final digits. The volume was loud enough that both Fiola and Arba could hear the operator. The number you are calling is not. Kipseli Square is fine, he concluded and shut his phone. They pulled onto the road out of the cemetery, which now should have been a changed road, made different by the new presence in the car, but it was the same. The cedars still stood aslant, as if running away from the sun. Potholes still riddled the broken cement. The cicadas still splat into the windshield with a crunch. So how long have you been in the city, Jaji? asked Fiola. The man scrunched his face, 
took out his phone and dialed through it again, putting it to his ear. It rang and rang and led to the voice once more. Oh, probably something like 10 years. No, no, 12 years, 12. And you? 17 years, said Fiola. We came here together with our spouses and kids in the spring of 97, a week after the Italians sank the migrant ship on Otranto. Otranto, the great connecting strait. How I miss the sea, he said. I have the best story from the sea, in fact. He flailed his open phone in the air before noticing it, closing it, and storing it back into his pocket. One day, I was fishing at the dock and finally caught a fish shipping home. It was a very unique specimen, with the scales, the shapes of hearts in green and blue. In the water, a school of other fish circled around as if begging me to let their friend go. Though I wished to keep this treasure, my conscience won. I threw it back into the water and the school of fish swam away. The old man gestured his hands, imitating their swimming. His fingers trembled. I headed back to my car, empty-handed. On the ground, just under the driver's door, there was a gold coin with the image of a fish, just like the one I had caught. I picked it up and out floated a young man, who also had the outlines of green and blue hearts on his skin. This is a very lucky coin, he told me, for it will grant you one wish. Because you saved me at sea, it is my turn to save you. But it was such irony, because I was the one who had put him in danger. I was the one who set a hook to his mouth. So naturally, I said, no. After all, wishes are not for the living, but for the dead, and I am not dead. Thank you. Reader this afternoon is soon as Nathaniel, a poet, broadcast journalist, and spoken word artist from Nigeria. His poetry collection, Teaching Father How to Impregnate Women, was selected as a winner of the Reed Leaf Poetry Award. The Riesling and Pushcart nominee soonest was named a 2021 Langston Hughes Fellow at the Palm Beach Festival, and in the same year, Poet Laureate at the Korea Nigeria Poetry Festival. His poems have been published in dozens of literary magazines in Nigeria, the UK, and the US. Soon as works and lives with his family in Abuja, where, as he says, when he is not scram scribbling in his milk house, he spends his time listening to the music of the spheres or reading the stars, close quote. His participation in the fall residency of the IWP has been made possible by a grant from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Please join me in welcoming Soonest. Thank you very much. I hope I'm very clear. Yes. Okay. So I've been told I have, uh, say, 20 minutes. So I would like to use that judiciously. I started my poetry with a spoken word. <laughs> so we started with the sound, we went to music, and I'm sure it's gonna end with silence. So I'll do one of the first pieces I did as a spoken word artist, that's where I'll start from. I hope I can remember it. I will look tomorrow's people in the eyes and ask them saying, what are you living for? Their laughs about true story of charades and lies, a sweet tale of folly, horror, and gore. They are but mere reflections and abstractions of reality, ever gay, ever jocund, ready to celebrate mediocrity. Below par the average they always give, lavishly they keep spending more, yet they have nothing in store. They are but mere feeds for maggots and worms, nothing better than farmyard weed, soon to be cocked off when the harvest time comes. Thus often it makes me wonder, if Ben 10, Naruto and Avatar is all they can offer, then there is no hope of redemption for this Eden. So listen, these children. A generation prematurely weaned off the milk of mother. These children born to an era of madness in the marshmallow mass media. These children, tutored and trained by tardy TV stars, learning foolish fads from frivolous fashion mags and acquiring stupid swags from inmate long chain behind bars. These children, Tutored by their nannies, sagacious dundies, ignoramus prodigies, these babies, toddling adults, needing nappies to hold back the drooping ignominies, oozing forth from their undies, these children. 
artists ones that celebrate their Halloween on our day of Thanksgiving, fat fed on French fries and many more lives. These children, again I ask you, for what are you living? Somebody take off my mask, for I am one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was born by a woman who sits like a man. Her legs wide open without fear for what the prime world would see and she would say, let them be a witness that this lady is endowed with an elephant-sized testicle. My mother wears yucca fibers for sandals and rabbit's floors and rabbit's floors for clothes. Her neck is adorned with shells, stones, bones, and dry berries. And she would say, dead memories too are ornaments. On certain days, she would sit me on her thighs and with affection in her eyes, she would say to me, boy, big sheep drown in pools, ponds, and puddles. Son, it doesn't take a penis to impregnate a woman. So at the school of her thighs, I have learned to castrate my lust in fate to fertilize the womb of barren dreams. And last night I heard her say, the open road does not lead to death. It leads to a lake full of laughter. Origin of sin. At 10, I will wake. A boy already drunk with the ashes of his father. Eyes inebriated, yet mind still sober enough to behold his mother playing pranks with a needle. Syringe to her right palm in her left cotton reeking of spirit. She divides the earth into an equator and sticks the needle into the upper left arc. Eyes closed in what seemed like suffering the bliss of pain, she mutters a prayer beneath her breath. I assume it's to the God of things lost. I assume it's to the God of things that do not want to be found. At 14, I will kiss a girl who needs her own history. She cultivates a forest on her head, a thick forest where her broken spirit can be led away, left to stray like an Azazel. She buries my head between her thighs. She wants that I will taste down there the essence of her father, a man who eats babies for lunch. She will have me weave her hair into one strand. There's a lone tree at the center of the forest she has cultivated. Her locks will serve as rope from which her soul will dangle to freedom. At 16, I will fail to take off my shoes at the door of the shrine house. I will fail to enter the front door of the votive temple with my back. I will enter the most holy place without knocking, only to behold behind the rendered veil the nakedness of God. She could have my eyes gorged out, but there's always another way to pay for crimes that were never committed. So at the heel of rags, I will leave my gown as a propitiation on the floor. I will burn my innocence upon an altar, and I will learn that day once more that there is more to the meaning of light. All right, this is one of those oldest ones I have, which is in my collection here, uh, teaching father how to impregnate a woman. It's titled Pattern Ritual. When father died, they shaved my mother's head to the scalp. And then they forced her to eat and bait with the algae green water gathered from rinsing father's cups. Six yards of white clothes sewn into a morning gown, mother wore a smile. It was more little than a frown. They forced her to eat, they said. She will need strength, strength to look the dead in the eyes and confess to lies. Lies that she ate her husband and his other children. Hers was a feast of worms, and though the sadness filled her stomach, she struggled to eat the maggots wriggling from the ears, the eyes, the mouths, and the orifices of delayed and decayed justice. They let her walk the middle on barefoot. Father's grave had been dug at the end of the groove. They claimed she had crossed the thin line between apples and snakes. So at the noddle, where two positions meet, she would light seven candles, then circle the grave with chalk. For 90 days, they confined her to a room. The other room, where every limb comes to pose as a patriot, where every screamer thinks himself a prophet, where every crook claims that he's a statesman. But after the lectures and mourners go home, my mother will rise and make love to silence. Thank you very much. I think I still got a little time. 
This is titled In Water. The world will not end in fire or ice. The world will end in water. I know because my father walked into the ocean in search of a young lover surfing upon the tides. He strayed too far into the orphan, unaware that there is no returning from the vanishing point. So days after the elders fished his body from the deep, they buried his corpse in the forbidden forest and hung his head on a pole used to mark boundaries. I know because my brother, a child of revolution, ran away from home in an upturned canoe down the meandering stream. He was running from the place where the earth is flat. He was trying to escape from a home where the war, which ended on the field, still rages in the hearts of babies. But the soldiers of misfortune got him first. The Marudas murdered his dream of ending the shaman's monopoly. They buried him in a watery grave without a coffin. I know because Ola Naskalabash was broken at the bank of the vertical river, Katrina's children still roam the lake within her eyes. And the children of virgins are learning to kindle fire in the belly of a sea. My mother was a flourishing creek, but she died of thirst. I watched her each day gasping helplessly for breath as more oil spilled into the delta of her lungs. So on the eve of her funeral, when the full moon was better, I walked into history's class. I raised my middle finger and posed a question about justice and the innocence of carbon. Yes, the world will not end in water. I know because my lover had an affair with Obuide. And now the children who name trees must become taproots. I know because I have lived all my life in liquid nights of primordial causes and ancestral shame. And now I am done like broth from which the prophet's herd will be served. Let those who could not make it into the ark nourish their souls and let them learn to develop gills and breathe liquid. All right. This is... Okay, I think I should do maple wood first. This is maple wood. <coughs> maple wood. Here. Lips fail to relay all that the eyes have witnessed. So we store memories beneath the bones and our bodies begin to learn how to pray to a new God that leaves us fat and trapped in debt. I am a man learning his lover's true identity, learning how love is a two-edged gillette blade cutting passion both ways, learning how sometimes the moons on her lips at midnight are prayers in devotion to another lover. Learning that forever is the day after the altar and the tears as she read her creed that day was in fear of a union that might just be a life jail then. I am a man about to jump off the cliff of his ego. I have just learned of a generation aborted, offered at the altar of exuberance. Dreams crushed beneath the poundings of a pistol carved from pride. Dreams squashed into paste in mortars of melancholia. I have just learned of paste made from mashed flesh and blood mixed with lanolin based creams just to keep clay from decay. I am a man pacing about his apartment remembering how empty the rooms were when I and my young lover rushed in body surging adrenaline and passion. I am remembering how all we had then was a mat for prayers and love making. The words relate to me all the arguments that we heard and I bow my head in shame. I notice how large the cobwebs have become. I am wondering what they stole from our marriage. I think they built our home from the thread that made up the fabric of our affection. Senabo say croons are hard times, and I realize I have woken up too late. An eternity has eluded me. But this is not the saddest part. What grieves me the most is her rapture. It's not her rapture. I am more distraught that she thinks I am deeper in love with perfection. I am more broken that she believes all I long to do was pass judgment. If only she knows that my existence did and still depends on the unusual magic of her imperfections. If only she knew. Mm. Okay, I think so more, so on and so on. This is titled uh, Oedipus Revisited. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oedipus Revisited. 
I swallow the yellow and purple pills again, and the child returns, but this time not to wail by the window. The child rises from his watery retreat, pulls his father from the bed onto the concrete floor, and drags his papa by the hair through the blue door. He throws his father along the corridor, asking for a name, asking for his mother, longing for breast milk, yearning for water, seeking blood to fill his empty veins. But his father has no answers. His father holds no reply. This is not the place to weave another lie. Fear writes the truth in the white of his vacant eyes. The child wants a body, something beyond the poor mix of mash and blood. This boy wants a mummy, something scared, something sacred more than God. But how will this child be made to understand that a woman learned how to sit comfortably inside a burning bush? So they accused her of defiling God, shaved her hair with broken buttons, and banished her to the wilderness of dogmas. What becomes of this child who has no ears when his mother cries in the grave cold night, when she craves her mouth to suckle her breast, whose tongue will console her? In the name of my mother, in the name of my mother, was written after Romero Oriogun, who is one of us here in Iowa with the IWP, I don't think he's here today, with the MFA program. He was with the MFA program. It was written after him. I did not want her to be asked the riddle of a lion and honey, nor be told the tale of the prophet who loved the harlot. No, I did not want the great controversy. No infidel or lost girl feeling unworthy in the presence of her father. No eyes peering into her souls. No elders rebuking demons that will not compromise. No witch tied to the stake and bonds to the fire of hypocrisy. No prophet seeing the end of our forever. No deacon measuring our lives on the standards of stewardship. No tides of our privacy. We have nothing to confess to you. I did not want her to be forced to cover her hair in prayers, nor to take off the strange gods of her earrings, neck chains, and bangles, no sermons of a golden calf and an irate prophet breaking two tablets of stone. She is not ill. So no hard sponges and hyssop. No erase. Don't try to erase her tattoos on her back. No scars are beautiful. Her scars are beautiful. She is beautiful in her sin. No fasting to regain lost virginity. The world has become too cruel. And even the Savior will not agree to be reborn. I did not want her to grow thin from feasting on the junk of Father's broad doctrines, but I knew no better. I had no one wise enough to teach me how to prepare tastefully the touch repast of compromise, nor the ambrosia to be offered the gods at the crossroads, so I muddied it all up. Having pork and spiked vodka for sacrament, pouring libations on wet earth, chanting psalms at the noddle, walking the sacred path with short feet, my boots trampling upon the face of the ancestors. Oh, who offers if our praises by reciting canticles with the rosary? Our Father has refused to answer my prayers because I prayed in the name of my mother. All right, before I go, um, I will not be able to go back home if I don't do one piece for my wife, of course. <laughs> there is no returning home. I would have to stay here. There's no returning home. This is titled Dewdrop for Sueba, who's my wife. After science became history and innocence became myth, we began to seek the Latin names of flowers. We asked why the only concern of a song's aesthetics is its cadence. <coughs> that night, the cricket killed itself inside me, and I became my other self, chief war correspondent for my body, bitter critic of my own mind. There are few battles a mother must fight for her son, but you delve headlong into them all, play lover, play priestess at the altar, knife in hand, ready to slaughter every doubt as a bond offering. Bleeding is a lesson, but men do not learn early in life, so sometimes you make the boy go through a cradle of thorns or have him dig through the rubbles of an uprising. I am a prime number, caught in the fire between P and MP, solving for the probability that the sun will rise tomorrow. I know the cost for others to flow. The river pays its tides to the sea. 
But when you ask me to join you in the rediscovery of distant places, I fear if the sun will not die again. I fear that the moon will eat our dreams for lunch. I say the shadows keep gathering to brood on the eggs of our happiness. But you ask me, what need has the donkey for the sympathy of camels? My volley child is hungry. You reveal that there is protein in the bones of the rainbow. You say we will buy nourishing fantasies with silver in the silence of this night. I want to hold on to your promise. And I want to pray that the dewdrop will save the fence thirst after words have lost their teeth in the land of drought. Thank you very much. And before I introduce our last uh, reader, I want to tell you about some upcoming events. Please join us for our next Cinema Tech event this evening at 7 o'clock in the Adler Journalism Building, Room 105, where Ralph Young, whom you heard here last week, uh, will pre-present the 2019 Brazilian film Bacaru. This coming Friday, 9.22, at noon, we will host this year's first fall residency panel discussion not at the Iowa City Public Library. Instead, the conversation will take place in EPB in room 304, AKA the Gerber Lounge. The topic this week will be the specter of professionalization, kiss of the muse versus literary athletics. Thanks to our colleagues at international programs, we will be serving free pizza to those who attend. <laughs> Later that Friday, please join us for our regular Shamba House reading and light refreshments at 5 p.m. Saba Hamza from Yemen and the Netherlands and Wesley Machezo from Malawi will read from their work. And finally, a week from today, on Sunday the 24th, the usual program will be a little different. To help the Stanley Museum of Art celebrate the launch of their spectacular new catalog in a time of witness, this regular event will be expanded we will start at 3 p.m. and go till 5 for readings by distinguished visiting IWP alums and catalog contributors, Paula Alexarek from Argentina and Spain, Tade Ipadiola from Nigeria, Esther Disharay from Germany, and Effie Dion from Turkey and now also from Latvia. They will be accompanied by this year's fall residency residents, Mary Rokanadavu from Fiji and Zveta Sofia. Sofronieva, Sofronieva from Germany and Bulgaria. Please join us for this literary cornucopia. Our third and final reader is the Taiwanese writer Kevin Chen, who started his career as a cinema and theater actor and eventually became a correspondent for a Taiwanese TV network in Berlin, where he now resides. He has published several novels, essays, and short story collections in Taiwan for which he has won many literary awards. His first English publication, the novel Ghost Town, translated by Daryl Sterk, was reviewed by the New York Times, NPR, Publishers Weekly, and was named to the list of best books of world literature 2022 by the Library Journal, and on the 2023 long list of pen translation prize. Ghost Town has been or will be translated into 11 languages and thanks to the good offices of Prairie Lights, for which we are so very grateful to be able to come here every Sunday, uh, copies are available for Kevin to sign. His participation in the fall residency of the IWP was made possible by the American Institute in Taiwan. Please join me in welcoming Kevin. First, I have a confession to make. I hate reading. Um, I'm a trained actor, so I'm supposed to love this, right? But I really don't. Um, so but I'm going to just share uh, something wonderful with you guys, because just a few days ago, my agent in Taiwan just told me that we just sold the copyrights for the English audiobook. So uh, in the future, there will be audiobooks. So I don't have to read. I just have to press play, and it's someone's going to read for me. And um, Chris just said uh, this book will be translated into 11 languages. Another wonderful news, the 12th language just immersed. And guess what? It's Ukrainian. Um, 
I know, and I'm just thrilled. So you will, yeah. So uh, hopefully, when the book is published in Ukraine, you I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I just got it from my agent. Yeah, and I just sold the number of the check, and I was very happy. That's all. <laughs> Terrible. I know, but I hope, I hope when the book is published in Ukraine, it will be the moment of peace. That's just my hope. Yeah. Um, since I hate reading, so I'm just gonna do it my way. Okay. Um, I'm gonna uh, uh, start with the story that actually happened to me here in this bookstore, Perry Lights. So uh, that was my very first in Iowa City. So I was very cranky, okay? Because why? Because a lot of writers share the same experience with me. Um, 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 just, you know, night before, uh, it took me two and a half hours just to go through the border control in Chicago airport. Of course, I missed my connecting flight. Of course, the, connect, uh, the flight they put me on later uh, with Sunes and Marta was delayed for three hours. So I was very tired, I was very cranky, and the next day we had to do a tour in the city. So to get to know the city, and one of the stops was here in the uh, Prairie Lights. And I was just cranky, I was like, oh my God. I'm going to be here for three months. It's a commitment, really, three, three months of your life. And I was just like, what am I doing here? Maybe, this, uh, maybe I'll hate these hideous writers, they will be awful to me, and I'm awful to them, and it's going to be a terrible, you know, terrible experience, and but then we were here in this bookstore, and suddenly I feel great. <laughs> I don't know why. I just like, well, oh, this is, you know, it's really funny because every time I visit a, a, a new city, I will always go to the bookstore because it's really a safe corner, a wonderful environment where I always try to find if they have a copy of my book, you know. <laughs> and of course, I did that. And of course, they don't have a copy of my book. I went to see because Chen, see, uh, they, of course, they don't have my book. Wait. So I was just waiting downstairs at the entrance with uh, my other um, not so hideous writers, you know. I realized I was kind of like them, you know, in this environment. And then there, um, a gentleman, his name is Chris. I don't think he's here. He just said something nice to me. He says, oh, I love your shirt. And I said, if, like, if you, you like my shirt, you'll love my book even more. And he was like, what? You know, and I just you know, started sell, to sell my book. And I, said, and I said, oh, they don't have my copy, of course. So, and, then, and he left. A minute later, he actually came back. And he told me, no, I just checked online. They do have a copy of your book. I said, no, I just checked. So we went to ask the clerk, the beautiful clerk down there, and I said, oh, they told me, oh, we do have a copy, but you went to the wrong section, it, 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 because it's hardcover, so you have to go to the hardcover section. So indeed, we went to the hardcover, and I found my book, and I sold the book to the poor gentleman, Chris, you know. And I was like, I'm not cranky anymore, because this is my calling. This is why I am in Iowa City. I'm here to sell one copy of the book. And I was like, okay, one copy I can do, and then a few days later, Natasha you know, emailed me and told me that, Prayer Lights got 20 copies of your book. I'm like, one copy I could do, you know, and 20, oh, that's gotta be difficult. So if this reading helps you a little bit, maybe you can consider, but whatever. Um, but I'm just gonna read something that I wrote in this book, actually about bookstore. And this bookstore is called Mingzhi Shu Zhi, uh, Tomorrow Bookstore, and the owners are actually a gay couple in a small town. The bookstore, she frequented was the Mingzhi bookstore. There were two bosses, one thick, the other thin. The thick one was called Ming, the thin one, Zhi. They put the, their names together into Mingzhi, tomorrow. Zhi happens to be part of Mandarin for Japan, Zhi Ben. And the bosses were Japan, Japanof, uh, J Japanophiles, meaning they're fans of Japan. They stocked the store with a lot of Japanese ball, ball print, uh, ballpoint pens, erasers, and compasses, along with magazines and language learning materials. Although she couldn't afford those Japanese uh, products, she often came to buy white paper with red guidelines for letters to Beverly in Shalu. On the counter lay a plate of homemade cookies, compliments of Boss Zhu. Sitting behind the counter, the two bosses would listen to Japanese language tapes and eat Taiwanese popcorn chicken. Sometimes they would read, especially the literary books. There was a whole shelf for novels and collections of lyrical essays. Betty would stand at the shelf and while away an afternoon. The thick boss would smile at her. Good books? He would ask. She didn't have any money to buy a book. 
at least not on her own. She and her sisters used to save up and pour their cash to buy a book. Then they would take turns reading it. At the time, owning a book was a luxury. The first thing you did was sign your name on the first page and the date. One time, she spied the thin boss holding the thick boss's hand behind the counter. When a customer came in, they immediately let go. They had to let go forever for good the day the police came to town. That was the last day of operation for the Tomorrow Bookstore. The building was cordoned off, the shutter rolled down. Betty stood on the other side of the do not cross line until the shutter rolled up again and the thick boss and the thin boss were dragged out in handcuffs and pushed into cruisers after being pulled apart by the police. Mean, the thin one cried out in, in anguish right before a cop landed his fist on his face. Pervert, the policeman yelled. That was the last time she ever saw them. Okay, so that's what I wrote about the bookstore. And um, uh, this book is called Ghost Town, right? So obviously it's about ghosts, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a novel in 45 chapters. And um, just, uh, it feels like a lifetime ago. Like first week uh, after our arrival, I had to give a presentation in um, Professor Christopher Mayer's class, uh, World Literature Today. And uh, in that presentation, I talked about the ghost culture in Taiwan, which is re really a uh, very important culture in Taiwan. And I share with my writers and the students that in Taiwan, ghost culture is so important that, uh, like, I cannot speak for every Taiwanese. Do we have Taiwanese people here? I don't think so, right? Um, but most Taiwanese, when we enter a hotel room, we will knock on the door. Why? Because we believe that each hotel room in this world is somehow taken by some spirits or ghosts. So by knocking on the door first before entering, we show some kind of politeness, some kind of decorum, and the spirits of the ghosts in the, in the room will somehow choose to be polite with us. Either go away or at least not haunt you. And after that story, uh, um, I started to hear ghost stories, spooky stories from my fellow writers. For example, Sava told me that she does uh, laundry in the morning at five o'clock in our laundry room in Iowa House Hotel, second floor. And she told me that after my story, she would knock on the door for herself in the laundry room to make sure that it's, that it's okay, that I'm doing laundry here because five o'clock, seriously, five o'clock in the morning, laundry room, it's spooky. And then Marta, where are you? Marta told me another spooky story. She was doing laundry there and someone said hello to her and no one was in the room. She opened the door and checked the hallway of course no one was there. And I got excited. I'm like, my God, our hotel is haunted. Yeah, so, you know, if you're interested in that, come to visit us, yeah, because it's obviously haunted. So I'm going to read you um, something about ghosts in Taiwan. I mean, ghosts in my childhood. If you have the book, it will be uh, uh, page 21. Ghost towns are deserted, but where are the ghosts? Are there any? There were a lot of ghosts in the countryside, living in people's oral accounts. Folks used to tell him never to go near the cups of bamboo out in the front of the townhouse. There was a lady ghost lurking in there, a poor daughter-in-law who was driven out of her husband's home after her chastity was compromised. She walked into the bamboo and hanged herself. She had haunted the bamboo ever since. Hanging in, hanging in, wait for a young man to seduce. When the dogs howled at the moon, they were blowing the dog kong, cui gao lei in Taiwanese, according to the Taiwanese idiom, meaning the beast had seen a ghost. So go to sleep, mother would say, and don't open your eyes, because if you do, you'll see it too. Even if you see it, you can't see it. If you see it, run away. Try to outrun it if you can. Don't look when you should not. If you do, you are gonna get caught. The kids said that the most ghosts were to be found in the willow trees that lined the irrigation ditch along the field. Don't touch the willow leaves, they used to say, or you will get mixed up with a ghostly maiden. You're certain to get zero on every examination, and the only way out of the mess will be matrimony. <laughs> the maid maidens in the willows would, were actually lonely, of old spinsters waiting for some unlucky sod um, to come marry them. 
There was another ghost in that ditch, a beautiful lady who jumped into the well after she was abused by a Japanese soldier. She was rescued, but then she got raped by the doctor she was taken to. In the end, she drowned herself in the muddy waters. But instead of being washed out to the sea, she ended up stuck in the irrigation network. She floated all the way to Yongjing, where she stopped in the middle of the ditch. There she, ditched, there she stayed, no matter how fast the water flowed. A temple in her honor was built up on the shore of, at the foot of the old town wall. His friends said that the moss along the water, water line was fresh green blood from her ghostly body. The ditch reeked so bad because of her ghastly stench. As for the mushrooms budding on the banks, don't touch them, let alone eat them. Those are her nipples. If you touch one, your luck will turn. If you eat one, your gut will become a haunted house. You'll die, blood spraying from your eyes before seven days are up. If you see a red envelope on the road, don't go anywhere near it. It contains the eight characters of that lady ghost birth. If you pick it up, hoping to find some money inside, you have to take her as your wife. <laughs> okay, so thank you. It's okay, it's okay, I have a lot to say. Shut up. <laughs> um, so just, I think it was this week, right, when um, uh, my beautiful fellow writer, Zenka, where are you? Zenka, you are here. She, oh, Zenka. Yeah, the lady in purple. Uh, she gave me a presentation at the, in the um, same environment as well, and she talked about auto fiction because she wrote a, a novel which was obviously auto fiction. I must um, confess, even though I studied English, I never knew the term until April. You know, when someone told me, "Oh, your book is auto fiction." I was, "Oh, what's that?" So it's a it's it's a fiction that has autobiographical elements, and she shared with us that how annoyed she was when people just took. Uh, the, well, they just believe that the protagonist in her book was Zenka herself, was the author, which is something ha that happened to me because this book is very much based on my hometown and me. My name is Kevin Chen, and the protagonist's name is Keith Chen. But I'm not Keith Chen, so I'm going to tell you what happened. Uh, so uh, the book was published in uh, 20, uh, 2019, December, uh, and then COVID happened. So we're going to, you know, so what's going to happen to this book? But it, it's weird. This book, my books, you know, this was, was my eighth. Before this book, my books never sold in Taiwan. They were like, you know, okay-ish, yeah. But this book somehow became a bestseller. And then, um, like, uh, sometime, actually, yeah, it was October. Um, uh, September, October, I had to travel back to Taiwan and did a two-week, very strict quarantine because it was COVID, just to receive several uh, literal, literal awards. And after my quarantine, the two weeks, Horrible two weeks, I got out. I wanted to see my family and my friends, right? And the first, very first person I met was uh, my cousin. I would never tell you that her name is Amy, yeah. But a, a, my cousin, who is not Amy, um, uh, uh, read the book. And I have to tell you what, what the book is about. Basically, the, the first chapter of the book, the book opens with a murder. Uh, Keith Chen had to return from Berlin, where he lives, where I live. Um, because he served several years in jail. Um, why? Uh, uh, and he has nowhere to go, so he came back to this very small hometown in Taiwan. Why is that? Because he murdered, he killed his German boyfriend. Okay, that's what the book is about. So uh, after those two weeks of uh, the, the quarantine, I met my cousin Amy, right? And she, when she saw me, she gave me a huge bear hug, and she started to the ball, like wow! I was like, okay, wait a minute. First of all, um, you, you, sh you guys should know that you know most Asians we do not hug. We don't really. We just don't. We don't embrace our parents. We don't say I love you, mom. No, we don't do that. Okay. You know what? If in fact, if I did that to my sister, like, I would love you, sister, and give her a hug. She would be like, what do you want? <laughs> you want money? Yeah, really, because that's what we we don't do that. It's just not part of our culture. But my, my cousin just did that to me, and she just really, really hugged me. I was, and she was really quiet. I was like, whoa, 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 why are you doing it? She said, I just read your book. I just finished Ghost. I was like, oh, wait, great. Why are you crying? She said, I didn't know you killed your German boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, so, what? No. It's a fiction. And she was like, what do you mean it's a fiction? I said, it's not a confession of a murder. It's a fiction. And she really couldn't get it. And I was like, OK, maybe I should do like a work on a PowerPoint presentation for you. Like, like the differences between <laughs> reality and the fiction, and she really couldn't really get it. And I was like, okay, cousin Amy, we were chatting every day on Facebook Messenger. 
uh, if I were in jail, how could that have happened? And she went, you know what she said? She said, oh, well, I just thought that Germany is a country of human rights. So, so every cell is equipped with internet and laptops and stuff. I was like, shh. Shut up! You know? And so this happens a lot, yeah. And and it's just, but you know, by now, Senka, I just want to share with you that I kind of take it as a compliment. When people confuse me, when they believe I actually murdered my German boyfriend. Um, and it's really funny because I actually have a German boyfriend who got a lot of funny emails said, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. um, I didn't kill anyone, okay? So I just wanted to, uh, to read um, the part when Ki Shen, with the moment he, uh, he met his uh, German lover, uh, whom he killed later. <laughs> it's a beautiful passage. <laughs> um, when the rain, this is Berlin, okay? When the rain turned into snow, he heard Bach. He sat by the window as the notes of a cello sonata came trotting, on, trotting in on snowflakes. The tone color was full. There was occasional mistakes that were corrected before the music could continue. The music were honest. There, were, there was no attempt to cover up and no regret. Keith imagined that the cellist must be a, uh, was a child, but the Schubert that followed was so world weary. It sounded like it must have been played by aged fingers. The snow fell for days on end. He stayed inside watching it fall and riding. He didn't go out at all. Every evening after eight o'clock, the traffic abated and the cello appeared. He would get ready for it by making a simple, din a simple supper. Lettuce and tomatoes with olive oil, a fried egg and stir-fried garlic shredded um, um, chicken, simmered rice. He would sit by the window and wait for the cello. When the sound came in, he dug in. He ate very slowly, reading a few pages from a book. By the time the cello faded away, he would have finished the last bite. One night, when the cello did not come, he finally realized how awful the meal tasted. Without, without a cello to hypnotize him, his sense of taste was wide awake. The cello was gone, so were the groceries. Oh no, he really had to make a trip to the supermarket. He carried two big bags of vegetables, fruit, and frozen meat home through the ankle deep snow. His jacket was covered in snowflakes, standing under a street lamp watching the snow fly. He remembered waiting for the bats under a street lamp in his hometown in Taiwan. There were no bugs or mosquitoes under the street lamps in Berlin, let alone bats. But the snow here had a palpable vitality, glittery in flight. The flakes were like little white bugs. The road started trembling. A gust of wind blew out of the station, pouring a cello into his scarf, his hat, his ears. The cello was late, but better late than never. He walked downstairs as the commuters who had just gotten, out, gotten off the train rushed out, forming a wave that pushed him back up the stairs and drowned out the music. The human blood quickly dispersed, and the low notes of the Bach floated slowly back up to the street. The wind heard it, the rain heard it, he heard it. It wasn't a neighbor after all. It was subterranean. He walked down the uh, stairs and saw T. He was his German um, boyfriend. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna um, finish this reading uh, by talking about um, my mother, actually. Because um, mother uh, in this book, well, I wrote about a lot of mothers in this book. Um, for me, well, it's very important uh, as a gay man to write about women, because women, um, sort of my saving grace uh, throughout my whole life. I actually have seven sisters. I, I've told my uh, fellow writers I have seven sisters. And why do I have so many sisters? Can someone take a guess? Um, yeah, so obviously having a son is very important for a traditional conservative Taiwanese family. So my mother tried seven times. <laughs> what are the odds? Uh, so my mother has seven daughters, and eventually uh, she had my brother, and then she had me. Um, and so my mother's whole life, she was giving birth. She was never happy. And 
Um, yeah, she was just not happy. And this is this is really, I wrote this book uh, really because I wanted to uh, get close to her because we were never close. Um, I don't think, I don't really, I really don't think she liked me at all um, um, she, when she was alive because she never understood what I was, what I wanted to do. Because when I was a kid, I told her that I, would, I wanted to become a dancer and she slapped me. I just told her, oh, the other day, she slapped me and said, shut up. I told her I wanted to become a writer. She said, shut up, you know. Um, that's why when Harriet, you know, when I knew that her parents are here today, I was like, this is, yeah, it would have been so nice for me. Um, but they just said, shut up. Um, but it, it's okay, because I did it anyway. Um, but um, 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 in order to get close to her, because we, my mother and I, we never sat down and talked. We, we, we were never close. And my, um, my brother, who was her prince, because after seven daughters, you can imagine, Eventually, she got eventually that validation that I'm a woman who can give birth to a child who has a penis. Yeah, because in this town, she was already a scandal. She's a woman who couldn't give birth to a son. Eventually, she got her my brother. So of course, my brother was her prince. And eventually, my brother stole her money and ran away. And then she turned to me <laughs> and realized, oh my. God, this kid is weird. He yeah. wants to become a writer. He's studying English, and then he's studying theater. Ah, you know, and so uh, yeah. So her, her whole life, she was never happy. So um, I wrote a lot about my mother in this book, and so I can, maybe I cannot blame my cousin Amy because um, this mother character uh, in this book, um, I used the real name of my mother, uh, which is Cicada. You just read about Cicada. I love the creature Cicada, the sound, uh, which is a, a very uh, uh, dominant in summer in Taiwan um, now as well and so this is uh, the passage I wrote about my mother Cicada it's a fiction <laughs> in mentioning her mother he meant to humiliate her Cicada was born late in the Japanese colonial era but early enough to start school before the war ended she only went for two days she didn't learn a thing besides what to do in the event of the American air raid. She would always regret it her, um, um, her lack of education because her illiteracy turned the modern world against her. When she deposited money in her post office account or visited the household registration office, she had to bring a daughter along. The motor vehicle office made an exception by allowing her to take the exam. Um, for the scooter operator's license orally. Please don't ask her to read the street size. <clears throat> she still had to take it a dozen times before she finally passed. She couldn't even write her own name, especially the character Chan in her given name. That character means Cicada. So she went by the name of Cicada Ling. But for all she knew, it was an occult symbol. Why did there have to be so many strokes? It was so difficult to write. Her daughters took turns teaching her, but she ended up so frustrated, she ripped up the paper, which actually happened. <laughs> um, how come she went to school only for two days? She kept changing her story. Sometimes it was because of the expense, especially for a girl uh, who was only going to get married. Sometimes she quit after her teacher, a freedom fighter, got shot in the classroom by the colonizer. Sometimes she just couldn't memorize the 50 sounds of the Japanese language. Sometimes the school closed after an American air raid bombed uh, the building to smithereens, killing a lot of kids. According to mother, another bomb, bomb fell into a nearby fish pond and rained fish all around. Everyone ran out to get some. The roads, the fields, and the trees were covered in the stuff. She came home with an armful, hoping to contribute to the family livelihood. But so did her sisters and brothers. There was a hail of raw flesh in the kitchen. So I just want to um, wrap up my reading by reading something that is not written by me, but by my fellow writer, Pussy. Um, I didn't tell her, so she was like, what? What did I do? I didn't do anything. Um, so the other day, Pussy was uh, doing a beautiful reading. I'm sure a lot of you were there in Shambo House. 
And I, after that, that reading, I had to buy her collection of, of poetry. You don't have to buy my book, but please buy her a poetry collection. And I have been reading her poetry since then. And somehow last time when I was uh, thinking about my mom, about this reading, and I, I, I just, you know, randomly I went through this, this thing. And somehow I turned to page 46, and this piece of poetry just really spoke to me. It's called Needles. It's about giving birth. It's about motherhood. And I was like, you know, what if, what if my, I didn't ask to see what this, what this piece of, of beautiful poetry is about. Um, this is my own interpretation. But I was just thinking, what if my mom was a woman who never wanted to give birth, but it was the system, was the whole society asking her to give birth to a son, and that's why she was never happy. Um, so in many ways, I need to thank Pussy for giving me this. Okay, it's called Needles. I hope they sow the heavy stench of placenta away before they stitch my lips into a silent prayer. Each breath taken feels like a failed attempt. All the thread I owned left with a man with shovel hands. On the hospital bed, I want to die, to forget, but the needles sing a song I cannot hear past my waist. The doctor says, I have a son. I want to kill her to kill him before he grows shovel hands. But his eyes blink in apology. He fights not to look like a fault. I fight not to look. My insides were opened twice that night and today by people who never asked me if I wanted a son. Thank you, Percy. Thank you. So this reading is for my mom. Um, even though she never liked me, but it's OK. I kind of miss her slapping. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And just a reminder, the books are for sale. See you here next week. Thank you all.